Well, hey, Bethel, good to see you. Why don't you turn to someone next to you and say, I'm so glad you came. <laughs> Why don't you stand with me as we get ready to go into worship? I heard that there are an army of hungry people that have come here. I heard that there's a group of people that aren't looking for entertainment tonight, but they're looking for encounter tonight. I heard that there are a group of hungry people that have said, I'm not looking for a presentation. I'm looking for the presence of God. I heard there's a bunch of people here that aren't looking for perfection here. They're looking for the raw, authentic gospel. Turn to someone next to you and say, I think that's you. <laughs> if you have come for the Open Heavens Conference this week, raise both your hands and wave them as high as you can. Look at that. Church, look around. Look at that, eh? These guys have come for the Open Heavens Conference. I love it. I heard there's a group from Argentina. If you're from Argentina, give me a big wave. Woohoo! Come on. The fiery ones from Argentina. Are there any people from Brazil that have come for the conference? Oh, oh, there's some right there. Yes, me, me. Do you know what I love about Bethel Church? Bethel Church isn't about presentation, it's about the presence of God. This place is raw, wild, and I believe that this week there will be radical signs and wonders that will happen in this place that will reveal Jesus as the Messiah. I remember Open Heavens last year, there was a lady by the name of Samantha, and I remember right at the back, just over there, she was uh, had paralysis in her left uh, leg from the Iraq war and she came and she got radically healed right at the back over there. I remember she ran to the front and she started to testify that the power of God had touched her and she had all feeling back. And I saw her this morning. She said, you know what? I came, I did BSSM one. I'm a first year and I have full feeling still in my leg, all, I've been totally healed still. Let's give the Lord a clap like you can do it again. I believe that it's gonna be a, a, a week of signs and wonders in this place. You know, why don't we just start tonight? Why don't we just start tonight? I, uh, I believe during worship, people are going to get radically healed. That where there have been ailments, where you walked into the building before, at the sound of the praise to the King, as Jesus' name gets shouted loud, as the name of Yahweh gets shouted loud and high, I believe that His presence would start to come upon people and almost unknowingly ailments would start to come off. The anointing breaks and, and, uh, uh, and unlocks, but it's the glory of God. Sickness can't even dwell in that place when His glory dwells. And I can imagine, just, just imagine with me that in unity, we start to link arms and we link voices and in unity, a sound gets shouted from this place unto Yahweh, unto Yahweh. And we start to shout His name. And at the shout of His name, He starts to draw near. And diseases start to get broken and healed. That backs that are on in, in pain start to get healed. That hearts that are broken start to come into alignment and wholeness. That those that can't see God rightly and themselves rightly, they start to come in alignment with this King. Oh Jesus, we haven't come for a presentation. We haven't come for entertainment. We've come for You. 
We've come for you. We've come for you, church. Give the Lord a shout. Just start lifting your voice now. Every voice, just start lifting a sound. Just start lifting a sound in this place. Start lifting a sound in this place. And lift your hands. God, not just another worship set. God, we're going in deep. We're going in deep, God.
Well, tonight we actually felt like doing something a little different. And we're gonna take communion before we go any further in worship. This whole month in September, we've been focusing on Sunday nights on worship and what it means to be a kingdom of priests unto the Lord, unto the Lamb. We're passing out communion. If you need communion, put your hand up. If you need the elements still. Thank you, ushers. Thank you, ushers. As we are serving, yeah, you can, you can actually have a seat right where you're at. And I want you to actually get out your Bibles with the elements, because we're gonna read Hebrews 10 together. We know that the Lord is powerfully moving still through his broken body and his spilled out blood. This morning as a church, we received the communion to remember his sacrifice. And out of that sacrifice, our response is worship, amen? So go ahead and open your Bible as you hold your communion. Thank you ushers for serving so well. Hebrews 10 talks about how Jesus is our great high priest. <laughs> no more sacrifices of blood need to be made because the blood of the Lamb of God was all sufficient forever and ever and ever. We will worship him as the Lamb of God. And as you read this with me, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to bring a revelation of Jesus as the great high priest who has now called us as a kingdom of priests to minister unto the Lord. That is our true calling, first and foremost, as ministers unto Jesus. It says in Hebrews 10, verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he has inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. His body and his flesh have made available access to the holy of holies. Oh, church, the great high priest, King Jesus, has given you and I access to worship him in the holy of holies. <laughs> there is no longer a veil. We're not singing for him to come. We are singing from a place of him indwelling inside of us. Amen. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, for we are now the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. As we receive the Lord's Supper, the greatest supper we could eat today, we are reminded is that we don't come before him in worship because of our good works, because we've measured up, because we've done our church attendance, because we were perfect in the way we treated our family today, we come solely on the merit of the blood of Jesus. And today, if you have maybe wrestled in your flesh or you've wrestled with your identity, I want you to let the blood of Jesus wash over your mind, over your thoughts, over your motives, over your actions. I want you to right now ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse you afresh and anew. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Maybe you made some decisions that are hindering your conscience from truly worshiping tonight. And we're here to take communion to remember it is only by his blood. It is only by his body that we have access to the Holy of Holies in worship. So let him cleanse you right now. If you need to give up a prayer of forgiveness towards someone, maybe yourself, maybe it's someone in your family, I want you to ask the Lord to give you the grace to forgive those that you need to release right now. 
Go ahead and do that. It doesn't, doesn't take long. It just takes a moment. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for your blood. I receive a fresh baptism of forgiveness right now. And I release forgiveness on those that I need to in my life. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead and open the blood together. I want you to hold that before you. Go ahead and let's close our eyes together and just focus on the, the blood of Jesus as our great high priest that offered himself as an offering once and for all to not just cover sin, but to remove our sin. That he was not only the great high priest, but he is the sacrificial lamb as well. He completed the whole temple in and of himself. So right now, I want you to just begin to thank him for his blood. Thank him for his all sufficiency. Jesus, we thank you for your all sufficient sacrifice. We thank you for your demonstration of love towards us, that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, we thank you that we cannot earn your love. We don't deserve your grace, but we freely receive everything you paid for by your blood today. We thank you for the stripes on your back that bore our healing. We thank you for the blood that flowed to cleanse us today and forevermore. We thank you for your blood, Jesus. We thank you that we can worship tonight <laughs> clear and clean in your presence. We thank you that we can come as your priesthood tonight, as a congregation of priests to minister to our God, to minister to our Lord. We thank you, great high priest, King Jesus, for your sacrifice. And we honor you and we remember the price that was paid for us. In Jesus' name, let's drink the cup together. I know I did it backwards. I'm just reading from Hebrews. It works no matter the order. It's true. It's true. <laughs> now remember, a new and living way he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his very flesh. Go ahead and take this wafer. <laughs> I, know. I love that we just did that backwards. Thank you for your body. Want you, if you are sick in your body right now, I believe tonight, right now in this moment, as you receive the body of the Lord, there is healing for you right now. I want you to lift your faith in God's ability to heal as you take of the Lord's Supper tonight, that he broke open his body so that we could be healed. He broke open his flesh so that every part of who we are, our emotions, our thoughts, and our very material body could be made whole in his presence. Jesus, we thank you. Go ahead and hold up his body. Jesus, we thank you that we could enter through the veil into the Holy of Holies because of the cross that was lifted up that bore your body in the flesh, that was ripped to shreds and that was given up as a sacrifice, as the Lamb of God laid before and bare before all of humanity. Jesus, we thank you for you are been ripped open so that we could be made whole. We remember your body that was freely given up for us. We remember the way that you opened a way to God through your body as the Lamb of God that was slain. Jesus, we receive your body into ours tonight. And we ask that you would fully restore 
those in this congregation and those watching online. God, we don't just ask for our own bodies, but for our families as well. God, that you would bring full restoration to your body and to our families tonight, God. We thank you for your sufficient sacrifice. We remember your broken body. We remember you walking through as the tabernacle amongst us and your flesh bore the stripes we remember tonight. You are our great high priest. We receive everything you paid for in Jesus' name. Amen. Receive his body together. It says, for let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And now we're gonna go into worship and we're gonna worship as a priesthood unto the Lord because of his sacrifice. Go ahead and let's stand together. <laughs> As we approach tonight in worship, how many here you have another level of faith to approach God, amen? I want you to just begin to lift your hands, begin to lift your hearts, just begin to lift up thanksgiving. Begin to lift up thanksgiving. You and I are now giving up offerings. It says, present your bodies as the living sacrifice, holy and pleasing, for this is your spiritual act of worship. Just begin to lift up your body as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Lord, I give you my voice tonight. God, I give you my energy tonight. God, I give you my focus tonight. You are worthy of it all, King Jesus. You are the King. High priest. Thank you forever changed. Thank you for your cross, O oh Lord. Thank you for your cross, O oh Lord. We are forever changed. We are forever changed. Thank you for your cross. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you, thank you. Changed by your love, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jesus.
You put death in its place. You conquered the grave.
Let's sing this chorus one more time. Jesus.
to him my comfort softly down.
is the Lamb, the Lamb of God who sits on the throne. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. We cry, holy, holy, holy. Is his alone? His is his alone. Lift up your own song.
throne, Lord. We cry holy before your mercy seat, O oh Lord. We cry holy, holy, holy is our land. Sing it again. You are holy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. Just tell him he's holy tonight. Tell him he's holy. Tell him he's holy. Tell him he's holy. Tell him he's worthy. Declare he is worthy. We agree with your word, Lord, that you are so holy, so worthy. You are so holy, Lord. This is who you are, God. As, we, as your people, we agree with your word that you are holy, Lord. You are holy, holy, holy. Yeah, keep going, keep singing or speaking it out. Just say, God, I agree, you are holy, Lord. Help me to understand what that means, Lord. Reveal your holiness to me, Lord. Reveal your holiness to me, Lord. We love you in this place, Jesus. We love you here, Lord, your people, Lord. We say you are holy and you are worthy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. You are holy, Lord. Keep going, keep going. This is our mandate as people of God to lift up the praises of our God. You are holy, this is who you are, Lord. This is who you are, Lord. This is who you are. This is who you are, Lord. This is who you are. This is who you are, Lord. Oh, this is who you are. This is who you are. This is who you are. Joy. 
put your hand on your heart just here and just say, thank you for this good news, Lord. Thank you for this good news. Turn to your neighbour and say, this is good news. God is holy. Our God is holy and worthy to receive all of the glory tonight and every night onto eternity. It's good news. All right, hug a friend. Tap someone on the shoulder and say, you look good tonight. We love you guys. Head back to your seats and we're going to watch church news. Hi, Bethel family. We have some exciting updates for you, but it's also uh, our last church news announcement. Don't, don't cry on camera, Paula. Pull it together. I always Pull it together. cry. Pull it together, we're gonna make it. Here's this week's church news. Guys, last weekend we shared some really exciting vision and updates about what God is doing with our Collier Campus Project. If you missed it, you can watch it back on YouTube or Bethel TV. It was a time of celebrating God's faithfulness and stewarding the words spoken over our movement. Over the coming weeks, there are going to be more opportunities to engage and partner with us, including gatherings, roundtable discussions with leadership, and more. Check out Bethel.com slash build to stay up to date. We've got two new Equip classes coming up. Visit Bethel.com slash Equip to get all of the details. First, Somos Uno, or We're One is starting October 3rd. Spanish speakers, come learn and get tools to bring greater strength and wholeness to your marriage. Then come learn the foundations of the prophetic ministry at the five-week prophetic ministry training. Get equipped, edified, and activated in the prophetic. Love After Marriage is hosting a five-day workshop November 6th through the 10th to help married couples experience breakthrough and freedom in their marriage. Listen, a thriving marriage is a marriage that's alive and well, and it is the best. Trust me. Register at Bethel.com slash events. November 1st through the 3rd, join us in person for Leaders Conference 2023. You will be equipped as a catalyst, prepared to release the truth and hope of the gospel into every sphere. We hope to see you there for this marking time. Register now at Bethel.com slash events. And that's it for this week's church news. Yes, if you miss any of these announcements, visit Bethel.com slash church news to learn more. Have an amazing week. Ciao, ciao. Right now in the Middle East, we're seeing a harvest like we've never seen before. I grew up reading the books and the stories of Muslim background believers seeing a vision of the man in white. Now that's happening almost every day. People are just waiting. They're looking for truth. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're desperate for, for hope. And what's been done to, to their people, to their families in the name of Islam um, has pushed many people away and they're mm -hmm. searching mm -hmm. and, and they're looking for, for the Prince of Peace. Hey, I'm Andrew. And I'm Kirsten. And we are missionaries to the Middle East. So the Middle East has been a long story in both of our hearts. We've done missions since we both came back to Jesus and we never thought it'd be the Middle East, to be honest. We mm -hmm. thought it would be other nations, but it was as we went and as we started seeing the stats of unreached peoples in, in the Middle East specifically that the Lord slowly began to um, wipe away the fear mm -hmm. and the misconceptions mm -hmm. about the Middle East and gave us a heart for, for His people. Yeah, one of the things that the Lord is doing in the Middle East that we feel specifically called to is establishing a place of worship and prayer in a place of His presence. Um, and we've just seen time and time again where when you worship and when you break through the atmosphere with the sound of heaven, like darkness has to flee. Yeah, so often we get the question, why would you bring your family with three kids uh, to the Middle East? And um, it's something that we don't take lightly, but it's our greatest joy. It's been so amazing to take them along on the journey. And as we experience God's hearts for the nations, we see our kids come alive and, and play with local kids on the streets and the doors that it actually opens to other families. And although there's many other cultural differences, the thing that you can find connection um, is family. We're seeing um, 
not only uh, Western workers coming in and seeing great harvest, but we're seeing an indigenous people, radical, bold leaders in their own regions raised up mm -hmm. and, and bringing the gospel, bringing transformation to their families, to their communities. Mm -hmm. For us personally, that's, that's our favorite, is mm -hmm. when we see uh, a young leader who has every reason to, to hold back, every reason to submit to fear, mm -hmm. uh, instead choose faith mm -hmm. and, and boldly proclaim the gospel when the consequences are far greater than anything we often experience here. It's been amazing to see and a privilege uh, to, to be used by God and to partner with Him in, mm -hmm. in seeing the kingdom mm -hmm. advance in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has a role to play and a part to play. Um, and just asking the Lord, how can I be a part of the solution to the Middle East specifically? Like, Lord, what do you want to do in me? All of us are called to the Great Commission, and, and right now maybe you're not able to go, but you can link your heart to what God's doing in the Middle East. And and for us, as we're launching back out, we we need prayer. We're, we're actually, revival is fueled uh, by prayer. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it through every revival that's marked history, and we believe it's the same for the Middle East, that mm -hmm. actually the greatest days of, of revival are ahead of us in the Middle East. And we can't think of a greater privilege than, than to go and to see disciples made and, and to see the kingdom of God impact the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Woo! Fire. Um, my name is Alyssa Morris, and we have some other fiery pastors up here, Angelo and Ben. And we would like to welcome our first time guests. So if you are online, first time, hello, I see you. And if you are in person online, we would love in person, a first time guest in person, sorry. Uh, we would love for you to stand up and just welcome you. So if you are visiting here for the first time, we would like you to stand. Thank you. Let's just give them a hand. Amazing, amazing. And keep standing. If you are here visiting for Open Heavens, why don't you stand? You're visiting for Open Heavens. Why don't you guys stand? Amazing. Wow, 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 wow. So good. Well, I know we have a crew right here from Oxford, so I'm just going to prophesy over my crew right here. Simon, um, so much, so much fun right here. So why don't you guys hold out your hands? So Holy Spirit, I thank you, God, for these revivalists, Lord. I thank you, God, for what they're ushering in in this next season, God. I thank you for a new reformation, God, of fire and of spirit, God, to fall on them, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are bridging the gap between those that oh, are, are, are in their head and those that want to know more of your spirit. And God, I thank you, Holy Spirit, for each and every call. God, I thank you, God, for Simon. Lord, I thank you, God, for Neil. God, I thank Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're gonna fall afresh on this whole crew while they are here, God. I thank you, Lord, that they are driving, woo! They're ascending the hill of the mountain together. And God says there's a special unity grace on you guys coming and taking back. And I thank you, God, for the cross-pollination of cultures from Oxford to the US, from the UX to Oxford, God. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you're doing, God. And we thank you, God, for creativity, God. I thank you for a grace for creativity, God, over them, God, to release your fire and release your favor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, God. And again, if you're all the first time visitors, stand up. I just want to declare this over you. In Psalm 1611, it says this. It says, in your presence is the fullness of joy and at your right hands are pleasures forevermore. And I want you to, if you're next to one of our first time guests, or even if you're here for open heavens, I want you to stand again and I want you to lay hands on them and just release fresh joy right now. Not even worked up, just God, that you would release joy, that you would cause joy from within to break forth, that any heaviness that you went through in this last season, any depression, that it would just, it would literally break out of you, that you'd feel the wells of joy springing forth in you. And we declare a new season, even a shift from this last season, we declare joy to spring up, joy spring up, come on, release joy spring up, joy spring up, drink, 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 God, we thank you that you say not to be filled with wine, not to be drunk with wine, but to be filled fresh with your spirit. 
In Acts 13, 52, it says that the disciples were continually filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. We, we just declare right now a continual filling that your cup would be overflowing. We don't want you just full, we want you overflowing. If you're sitting down right now, just put your hand on your neighbor even and just say, fill them, Lord. Fill them, fill them, fill them, fill them, overflowing, 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 whoo, overflowing. Thank you, Lord. And then I, as you, you can keep ministering, but I had a picture in worship when we were worshiping, and it was, it was as clear as day, it was a horse running and then instantly after I saw the horse running I saw that that scene in Forrest Gump when he broke out of the 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 leg um like cast things is there anybody in here that has like you have cast or some type of walking device on your legs in here anybody in here I saw you just breaking out of those right here over here yeah, right there. Go ahead and stand up. Just lay your hands on them. Is there anybody in here that you have a passion to be able to run and you just can't run? You have some type of injury in your body. Yeah, go ahead. Stand up if that's you. Yeah, and if you can't stand, just keep your hand raised. We're going to pray for you. Just pray for them right now. Just declare over them that vision of them running like a thoroughbred horse them running with strength. God, we thank you. We thank you, God, for the, the breaking out of the limitations tonight, the breaking out of the past tonight. We declare strength in your legs, strength in your legs, strength in your legs, strength in your legs right now. Strength, yeah, Boom. receive it. Yeah, we declare any lingering energy, any injuries, any spirit of infirmity, any hopelessness in those areas just to go. Yeah, we declare healing in Jesus' name. Go ahead and test it out. Test it out. Mm. I hear some claps over here. If you experience any breakthrough, go ahead and raise your hand, amen, right here. Thank you, God. Yes. Fuego. Yes, right here, amen. Well, it's just the beginning. I'm gonna give it to Ben. Wow, God is good, amen. Miracles are breaking out already in this place. This is awesome. Uh, oh man, I feel the Holy Spirit. Um, so, I feel the Holy Spirit, that's good. I feel the Holy Spirit really strongly, which is an amazing way to do church. Oh, Jesus, we love you. I, I, I really do love my Argentinian brothers and sisters so much. Mas fuego en el nombre de Jesús, amen. Why don't you guys just stand to your feet? If you're from Argentina and you're visiting, if we could get some of my team to gather around them. If you guys are around, these fire breathers, why don't you just, just, just gather around them? I, I just really felt like uh, from the Lord, just a real sense of honour in my heart for that pioneering spirit that was on your nation. I, I just really felt like to honour, even as a house, that revival spirit that actually broke out in your nation before it really broke out in ours in the early 90s. And I just really feel like uh, there's something that you and your country has pioneered uh, as you're coming back to receive from us. I actually believe that you're going to walk away with more than you can bargain for. I really believe uh, that the Lord is going to tip the tables. And as we've received the revival anointing in some way from your nation, I believe that there's fresh grace from our house and from our nation that's going to be released over you. And you're going to go back carrying fire to a degree that you've never seen before in your houses of worship. So if we could just as a company of people, just stretch out our hands toward them. If you're watching online, just begin to pray in the Spirit over them. And so right now, Holy Spirit, wow. Holy Spirit, release 
fresh fire upon this company of people in the name of Jesus. We're asking, Lord Jesus, that You would grab a hold of these people this week in the name of Jesus. We pray that this would be the beginning. This wouldn't even be the high watermark of this week, that this would just be the beginning of a tipping point. Father, I thank You for the spirit of revival that is on the nation of Argentina. We honour it in the Name of Jesus. We thank You for the fact that we've received from them. And we're asking, would You pour it back over them? Would You pour fresh anointing, fresh grace, fresh power back over them in the Name of Jesus? Can we just pray in the Spirit, just for 30 seconds? Pray in the Spirit over them. That's it out loud. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, we just declare glory to glory, line upon line, precept upon precept. That which you've done before in Argentina, would you do it again with far greater glory, with the former glory not compared to the latter glory of what you want to do in that nation. In Jesus' Name. In Jesus' Name. Man, if I was you and I was hungry, I know where I'd be right now. I'd be over there somewhere, (laughs) jumping in the middle of that glory pile. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I think we were going to do more ministry. Alyssa, I don't know if you're coming back. Angelo, if you're coming back. Otherwise, I'll just continue on. Who's hungry tonight? Who wants more? That's most of the hands. That's awesome. You, sir, in the black shirt with both your hands up in there. Yeah, why don't you stand to your feet? What's your name? Leo the Lion. I love it. Leo, I... As I was looking at you, I I literally saw all over your head um, just the word hunger. And I believe uh, the Scripture, I think it's Luke 6.21, where it says, Blessed are those who hunger now, for they will be filled. I believe that you've gone through a season of contending and crying out uh, for something very specific from Jesus. And I believe the Lord says, Blessed are those who hunger now, wow, for they will be filled. And I just bless the hunger that's on your heart. And I thank you that God doesn't just make us hungry to torment us, but He makes us hungry because He wants to satisfy us. So right now, I just ask Jesus for the bread of life right now to come down into Leo and to satisfy him with more than enough in Jesus' Name. Let there be a release of fresh fire and fresh power over him in Jesus' Name. Leo, I believe you've been contending for a realm in the miraculous. I, I just saw even... Even to your left right now, I just saw angelic activity all around you. I believe uh, there's a miracle working anointing over, over your life. And I believe you've, you've seen great miracles even in the past. But I feel like God's saying you've been contending. Wow, I actually feel like you've been contending specifically to see cancer healed. And I believe the Lord says, I want to satisfy that prayer because that prayer was something that I placed in your heart because I want to see that answered more than you do. So Father, right now, would you put uh, a spirit on him that destroys cancer? Would you uh, put on him a boldness and a courage to run at that disease, to see it bow its knee to the name of Jesus? I pray for that. I pray for an unusual boldness to come on you in this season where, wow, not only are you contending for it, but you have a faith that comes up in your spirit that you know that you know that you know that cancer will dissolve because the King of all kings that lives inside of you wants to come and destroy it through your life. In Jesus' Name. In Jesus' Name. Amen. Um, oh, hi. You guys are a family, I think. Um, you're wearing a New York hat and then you're... So the lady sitting next to you, you're wearing a jean jacket. You have two kids right here. You want to stand? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. 
<clears throat> yeah, God is on you. Why don't you just hold out your hands? Yeah, there's just a spirit of breakthrough over you. So God, I thank you, God, that you're marking this family, Holy Spirit. And I thank you, God, for what she's pioneered in the spirit, God. I thank you for the grace of intercession on her life. And God, I thank you, Lord, for, woo, that you are builders. God is saying that you've been building, you've been building, you've been building, God. And I thank you for breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus, God. I thank you, God, for what they're called to, how they're called to equip the church, how they're called to send, God. And we just to declare the fire of God to fall on their ministry, God, the fire of God and the anointing of God. Lord, I thank you for where they're going to take the gospel, God. I thank you, God, for where you're, um, how they're going to train people and send them out, God, and on missions, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, um, for that fire. And I thank you, God, for keeping their kids safe. If those are your kids next to you, God, I just declare over your children that they will prosper and they will thrive in this season, God. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. Woo, we just declare fresh wind and a fresh refreshing, fresh wind and a fresh refreshing, fresh wind and a fresh refreshing. Pour out your spirit right now. Pour out your spirit right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Just put your hand on your stomach and say, more, Lord. More, 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 more. More fire. More, more joy. Fire and joy. Fresh fire, fresh joy, fresh fire. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Just take another drink. Hey, thank you, God. Thank you that we get to worship you. Thank you that we get to exalt you. God, thank you that we get to lift you up. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you brought us here, God. We just exalt you tonight. We drink, we drink, we drink more fire on you whoo hey more fire yes whoo yeah yeah if you feel real stirring right now if, like you you just have a like a fire just stand up and grab i just feel that what leslie was saying and i saw something else tonight like that that woman that pressed through and just she grabbed what she wants she grabbed the hem of his garment she was hungry. She didn't wait. She grabbed it. Go ahead and grab it tonight. Grab it. We grab. We reach through the inconvenience and we grab it tonight, Jesus. Hey, shatarara ba 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 ba. Fire. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Wow, there's just a real atmosphere. We thank you for breakthrough. God, we thank you for healings. I just feel ears popping open right now. Thank you, God, we grab it. I just check your eyes right now. Wow, thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Yeah, we just declare, I feel somebody grabbed and your cancer's dissolving. Check your tumor. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. We just press through and we grab. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Wow. Woo! Wow. Yeah, I just really feel that you're gonna, you're gonna continue. There, there's something available tonight, and it's Him. Just keep, even as we keep going tonight, just keep reaching and grabbing in faith, reaching and grabbing in faith. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Wow, stay standing just for a bit longer. I, I feel it's very interesting that Claudio Fritzen is coming, and. Uh, I just feel really something really strong, obviously, on, on his ministry. And obviously, as we've been blessing what God's about to do in Argentina and, and already blessing what God's already done, I feel it's really interesting. Even the faith that I feel in the room right now, is there's a electricity in the Spirit. And, 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 I, and I love what Mark's Claudio's ministry, uh, a line that Mark's Claudio's ministry is, if you want it, take it. And I just feel like there's just something available. And I feel like there's a reason that you're standing. I, I believe that there's something available. And I feel like if you want it, take it. It's there. It's, there's something available in the Spirit right now. So just for a moment, just close your eyes. Just close your eyes and begin to say, God, I want it. Whatever it is, that, that thing that stirring, that stirring that's inside of you that says, I want that. Just begin to ask the Lord. I believe it's something that's Mark Claudio and even that beautiful nation of Argentina. There's a faith anointing. And so just right now, just tap into the grace that's available. 
and I bless you to be as quiet or as loud as you want. It's not about volume, but if you feel like, oh man, I'm, I'm bursting on the inside, like I'm longing for this thing, that's okay for you to express it with yelling and screaming and shouting and running around the room if you want. It's okay to sit still and quiet and receive it. It doesn't matter, but I just bless you. I bless you right now to, to partner with the faith that you're feeling. Woo! That's it, let it rise. Let it rise, let it rise. God, we're hungry tonight. We're hungry tonight. We're hungry tonight. We're hungry tonight. Come and touch your people. Come and touch us with fire. Come, Holy Spirit, release more. Release more. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We really felt like there's something really special that's happening uh, with this Argentinian crew. And Dan Carnaval uh, is like a son of the Spirit to me. Um, he was one of my students, but also one of my third years and is a mighty man of God. I really felt like um, that he was gonna release something over us that we were gonna receive from them. Is that okay? <laughs> As we've blessed them, I believe that we're about to receive back something from them. Are you guys ready to receive, Dan? Um, well, I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for this, but uh, when we were in worship over there, uh, this random thought came to my mind. Um, I had the thought of, if you had to say something tonight, what would you say? And I just remember that. Um, <laughs> so that's helpful whenever you need to speak in front of thousands of people. So, and it just got to remind me of Romans 12. That transformed my life, and that's something that this house brought to my life, and also from Ben. Um, but when I was over there, Romans 12, for, like always for me, it's being something that is costly towards God. Um, but after leaving third year, my, my mindset was looking, giving something costly. Yeah. But then when I went back home and just started pursuing God and opening things back home and keep on pursuing what my parents, what our parents back home from Argentina opened it up, God told me to read it again, and it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view on, of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice. And I've never realized that it says, in view of God's mercy. You can never sacrifice something if you don't see through the lenses of mercy. Um, and that just transformed my life. So when I was over there, I'm just thinking, God, if I would just have to say something tonight, Thank you for everything that you've done in my life. Thank you for everything that you've done in the 50s, 60s, 80s, 90s in Argentina. But we're, we're still in the 2023 now. Yes. <laughs> and there's a 2030 coming, 40, 50s, and we still want more. So God, in view of your mercy and everything that you've done towards us, thank you for, for those days that we didn't, we didn't even know who we were, but you still loved us, you still looked at us, you still pursue us, you still look for us, and you still saw us when nobody even wanted to do anything with us. You looked at us because you loved us so, so much. So because of that mercy that you showered upon us, we can now come tonight <laughs> and bring you a sacrifice, a living sacrifice that is our life. So God, tonight we just bring our whole life right here in this altar, God. Thank you for people that are just having encounters loudly, but people that are having encounters profoundly. Thank you, God, because of the, of the, of the, the revivals that you've done in the past in Argentina, in the 50s, in the 60s, and how every, everything's super connected. But God, we just want more. Yes. So God, we pray for more. Yes. And it's not, it's not, it's not going to be more because we're going to just strive for more. It's going to be more because we're going to have a new revelation of your mercy. Yes of that cross, of what you've done in that, in that place for us, because it's not going to be able because of us. So we just surrender one more time here. I would just say, God, this whole week, tonight, just encounter us, because we need you so much. We need you so much. Oh, wow. Isn't church fun? Church is fun. Why don't you guys all stand to your feet? We're, gonna, we're actually going to lean in and take up an offering in a minute. <laughs> we just gave our, our lives as an offering, so that's, that's good news. Uh, that means we get to enjoy the resurrection life that Jesus promised. 
Death is the doorway into life. Amen. Amen. Uh, well, guys, I just had one one simple th- one simple thought as we went into the offering uh, tonight. I, I just was so drawn to uh, John chapter twenty, and then when it was still dark, that Mary went to the tomb, and it, it was just this revelation of the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead in the dark. <laughs> In the darkest place, when all hope was lost, with the stone in place, life began to fill the dead body of Jesus. And I just believe that um, as an inheritance of this price that this Christ paid for us, this victory, this same resurrection, Romans 8 talks about the same spirit that rose... Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. I just get this sense that uh, there are some of us that are in pretty dire financial situations tonight. And I just felt like I wanted to speak just to you. If you feel like you are in the dark, that all hope is lost and it's, it's, it's over almost for you. If, if that's you, if you wanted to just be humble enough just to put your hand up right now, I really feel like I'm speaking just specifically to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and your boldness. If that's you online, you can put that in the chat. I just want to remind you that when the stone was in place, where the enemy thought he had won, where he'd been in the grave for for two days, seemingly this promised Messiah was not who they thought he was. All of a sudden, life began to fill his body. And so just right now, if you're in a place where you need resurrection from the dead in your finances, it feels like it's that dark night. I just ask right now for resurrection life to begin to fill their bank accounts in Jesus' name. I pray right now for that resurrection power that rose Christ from the dead. Would you speak to those dry bones? Would you speak to those uh, dead situations financially? And would you come with resurrection power, I just ask for miracle working power to come and that we'd even hear testimonies in the next uh, week of just radical turnarounds of all of a sudden partners coming and wanting to give money, all of a sudden just uh, yeah, resources return to them where, where, where courts are waiting for rulings, where uh, where banks have money stored away for them and, and, and they can't seem to get access to it. I just pray right now that the stone would be rolled away in these situations, in Jesus' Name. In Jesus' Name. Woo, I thank You that You did not stay dead. <laughs> I thank You that You rose again and the stone was rolled away. And we thank You, Father, for victory in these lives of everyone who had the courage to put their hand up. May it be a resurrection from the dead season. In Jesus' Name. In Jesus' Name. Now I know I took up, uh, we're taking up the offering and I'm only speaking to very specific people here, but I really felt um, God wanted to raise the dead in these situations. So I wanted to just take the time to focus in on that. Um, is that Okay. He wants to raise all of us from the dead. That's awesome. But I really felt like he wanted to release a miracle in these lives tonight. Um, wow, Jesus. It's really hard to move on when you feel the presence of God so strong. But we're going to try and uh, take up an offering in a minute. <laughs> I have the worship team behind me. Before we do that, I, I would love to declare truth. Would that be okay? Can we declare truth together? Can we uh, read together offering declaration number two? Is that okay? Number two. You guys ready? Just me, am I ready? I'm ready, yes. Are you guys ready? Okay, just checking, just checking. Okay, as we receive today's offering, we are believing you for heaven open, earth invaded, storehouses unlocked, and miracles created, dreams and visions, angelic visitations, declarations, impartations, and divine manifestation. Anointings, giftings and calls, positions and promotions, provisions and resources to go to the nations, souls and more souls from every generation, saved and set free 
Harry Ingham revelation. Thank you, Father. As I join my value system to yours, you shall favor blessings and increase upon me. So I have more than enough to co-labor with heaven and see Jesus get his full reward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, guys, if you're looking to give online, uh, you can scan that QR code. Otherwise, we have uh, buckets up the front here as the band plays. Why don't you come and give generously tonight? tonight. I mean, we sang shout to the Lord, okay? Oh, thank you for that throwback. I felt like I was back in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in the 90s. I had a moment. It is a season of the old and the new treasures being brought out. So the old and the new. Woof. He's moving. If he's touching you, just, just lean into that. Just lean into that. <laughs> oh, boy. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thanks, God. Thanks, God. Welcome to Bethel Sunday night. We're glad you're here. We just thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here with us. Well, tonight, I want to introduce our speaker if, if they're just a normal speaker, we don't always do introductions, but this, this is special because this is actually our Bethel worship pastor. And, um, and we've been doing kind of a series on worship the last uh, few weeks, and man, I am so expectant for what Peter Mattis has to not just teach, but impart tonight. Will you please welcome a man after God's own heart, Peter Mattis. Hello, hello. You guys can take a seat. Woo, it's rowdy in here. I like it. I like it so much. Um, I'm going to start. You probably can't see it. I'm feeling it. So if you just want to let you know what's happening a little bit. I was cleaning out my backyard um, this past weekend, and I don't know what I did. We filled up four truckloads full of brush. I was 10-foot high brush. And somehow in there, I got, um, oh, Desi's already coming in. There it is. <laughs> um, we, uh, somehow in there, I think I got poison oak on my eye. So if you see me in the hanky, just it might be dapping my eye just a little bit because it is a little bit swollen. Um, I was a little toad yesterday. Honestly, I was swollen up, and I like, could see the bottom of my eye. And I, anyway, we're good now, though. But just, just in case, it could also be the Lord. Also, I'm from the South, so I've always kind of wanted to have that hanky. <laughs> 
I grew up in inter- interdenominational church and some people start running. <laughs> that could happen tonight. This is my wife. She gave it to me. So I feel like a little, you know, I'm carrying her with me. My beautiful wife, Claire's home. We're about to have a little baby girl in about three weeks. We are so, so excited. We have um, a little boy named Benjamin Shepherd. He is the absolute cutest little nugget in the world. Um, he is so, so adorable. Um, we love him so, so much. They're, they're at home. But we are in, in the countdown mode um, to, to count down to t- having number two. So we're really, really excited. But if you see me dabbing my eye, that's, that's what's going on. Um, it could also be the Lord moving. But um, I'm, I'm really expectant for tonight. I feel, I feel really, um, I feel the Lord in the room. <laughs> that's a good thing, hey? Um, yeah, Desi, can you go ahead and prophesy? I feel the Lord in the room, and when he's in the room, I don't want to move. I love this man behind me. He has his little boy down here. His name's Tiago. Give him a little wave, Jazz. It's brand new. Like, what, four weeks? When Desi plays keys, it's an arrow. It's not a manipulation tool. It's not a Hollywood emotional moment to get a rise or a charge out of you. It's an arrow. David played his heart before Saul. And it was an arrow in the spirit. And it launched into the deep things. And I feel like tonight, I have like probably five or six pages of notes. And I actually do feel like I'm supposed to teach. But more than me teaching, way more than me giving you tools, which I want you to have. I want you to have a face-to-face moment with the Lord. If you were here at our encounter night a couple of weeks ago, I talked about this, but with my life, if I can be a servant and I can set up, sorry, I feel the Lord. If I can set up a table between you and the Holy Spirit as a worship servant and in the worship moment, you come and get your seats and you, know, you get situated and you, and you feel them close. If I can be a server or a waiter that serves the food at the table of you and the Holy Spirit, I say, you good, you good, you got what you need, you got what you need, great. And you forget that I'm here. If I can serve you tonight, that is my heart's cry. That you wouldn't leave tonight saying, oh, what an amazing word from Peter. That you would say, you would leave tonight and say, oh, I saw Jesus. more than anything else I can give you, more than the practical teaching which we need. If you can see him and you can minister to him tonight, it'll be an arrow. If you're not a musician or a worshiper, it's fine. You're a royal priesthood. You actually are a worshiper. You're a worship leader, you're a priest. First Peter says you're a royal priesthood. Haley talked about it last week. Whatever you're doing, if you do it unto the Lord with all your heart, your soul, your strength, stay at home, mom, stay at home, dad, working out in the courts or in the hospitals or in education system or in the political system, whatever, whatever it is, an Excel form before the Lord. If you do it with the position of worship in your heart, a fragrance will fill that Excel form. I promise you. If you can do it with worship in your heart, that anything you do is done unto a fragrance unto the Lord. It's incense rising day and night, night and day. I'm just working my nine to five, Peter. No, no, no. It's more than that. Because it's not just what you do. It's who you're ministering to. I don't care if you're a musician. I don't care if you're tone deaf in this place tonight. It doesn't matter to me because you have been commissioned as priest to bless his name. Tonight, I hope you get messed up, not by me, but I hope you get messed up and become addicted to the smile of Jesus. Because when you feel his smile, when you see his eyes, everything pales, everything bends its knee. Every circumstance you're in, whatever is happening in your life, whatever the impossible situation that you're facing, every single wall collapses under the presence and the light of his glory and his grace. His smile is over you tonight. 
So tonight, if you need to stand and you need to sit and you need to come up here, you get with him because way more than you hearing my words, I want you to hear his words because he has the words of life. Where else would you go? What else would you do? He has the words. Lauren came, she's prophesying over there on her instrument as well. Prophecy isn't just spoken with words. Prophecy is given from musical instruments. It's more than a violin. It's a weapon of warfare. Jehoshaphat, when marching into the heat of battle, sent the worshipers out first. I don't know if you've seen most of the worship team, but most of them are scrawny little young guys who are just up there playing. I probably wouldn't have sent them into the front, front line of battle. It's probably, honestly, I love you boys. I love you guys. I would have sent you first. But you put a violin in their hands. And Lauren's first chair section of the North State Symphony, done with excellence, but ministers to the heart of God. And it's like an aroma. Tonight, Holy Spirit, would you open hearts? Would you break their hearts like you've broken mine for anything less, anything less, nothing short of ministering to you. Greatest commandment, to bless the Lord, to love the Lord with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And the second it's like it to love your neighbor as yourself. Mess them up tonight. You guys okay? Woo. When he comes, I just cry because he is so stunning. I was going to tell you my story. It doesn't really matter, to be honest with you. I walked into those double doors 12, almost 13 years ago. Fell on my face because I heard a sound of worship. I grew up in the Vineyard Church. It was wild charismania. Honestly, it made some of our church services look tame. <laughs> How many of you know I'm talking about, right? I grew offended from the Lord. I drifted away from him. I drifted into the world. I knew in my gut that he was real. I'd seen too much. I'd seen people get out of wheelchairs. I'd see the deaf hear. I'd seen the blind see. I played hide and go seek among people slain in the spirit. My dad was a vineyard pastor and it was wild. Bill came to our church in the 90s. Randy would come. We traveled with Randy Clark. But I grew away from the Lord because my heart grew cold. Because I didn't see the real Jesus behind all the human flesh. And I needed to find him. I need, it had to be real. It had to be real. My friends convinced me to come to Bethel. I knew about this place. And I knew what you crazies did. <laughs> I was not happy, but they convinced me to come. I got in the car in San Francisco. I had shut down anything of the Holy Spirit in my life. I got in the car of a 95 Honda Civic that barely ran, student life. And I sat in the back seat and my hands started vibrating and I knew what it was and I was not happy. <laughs> I thought I had fully capped it and contained it to so my friends didn't know, but now we've had a conversation like, oh, we knew Peter what was going on. I was like, okay. I came in those back double doors and Jeremy and Brian were leading worship. I think it was Jeremy's first day leading worship here, Jeremy Riddle. And I knew him from the vineyard and I just fell into an ugly cry heap in the back because I heard a sound of adoration. I heard the sound of a heart completely yielded, not Jeremy, I heard a people. I heard a group, I heard a temple, I heard a church that decided to declare the name of Jesus above anything else and believe that when he said on earth as it is in heaven, it was real. These speakers aren't manipulation tools. We don't strive for excellence to reach a bar that can be an accolade from the world's perspective. We're excellent to not be a distraction. The table won't wobble so you don't get distracted from seeing Jesus fully. If I can serve, I sat back there in that back row and I said, I give my life to this. 
I could walk you around different places in the sanctuary. In my first year, I was, I had been a worship leader for so long and the Lord told me not to join the teams. And so I stood at that, those back double doors right back there. And I felt the Lord as I grew back from the stage and I, I would back further and further away and I'd feel the presence of the Lord in the secret and the quiet when no one knew. And I'd face those back double doors right there. And I turn around as soon as I, it was weird, I was weird. I turned around and I faced those back double doors and I literally would worship like this, facing literally the door. And I felt the smile of God. And he was purging me of this need to be seen and my addiction to the applause of man. Purging me. The next year I was a worship leader in our second year school of ministry. And I had a whole different journey. I ended up leading the worship room. We're bringing the worship room back, by the way. If you don't know what the worship room is, um, it was Bethel's expression of worship and prayer, adoration and praise. It was Benny's heart. I worked with Benny for four or five years, helping oversee um, our community of wild worshipers who had had sets at 5, 6, 7, 8 a.m., 11, 12 p.m. at night. We had bluegrass and gospel and you name it. We had all sorts of different kinds of sound. We had 29 different sets, I think, at, at the beginning. I don't have a need to bring it back there, but I do have a need to set an altar before the Lord where the only agenda is ministering to him. I love leading you. It's a privilege of my life, but I want to create a space where the only agenda is ministry to him. The only reason you're in the room is to bless his name and to adore his name. I led that community for, I don't know, four or five years and then came over to be a second year revival group pastor in our school of ministry. I was a sound guy working in the back. I mixed ears for Brian, <laughs> scared out of my mind just to make a mistake. <laughs> but I didn't know Brian's heart. And Brian is a worshiper through and through. As I grew to know him and see him and him and Jen, I realized they're the real deal. They're the real deal. And I would sit back there on my little audio board mixing and gosh, felt like I was barely making it most days. And my heart started to grow a little impatient with what the Lord was doing. I wonder where he was at, what, what was going on? Why was, why was he in this? I wanted to be a worship leader. I wanted to do these things. And the Lord came and spoke to me so, so kindly, but I was so impatient. I've been leading worship at, at our Twin View campus, which is a couple miles from here. I was a sound guy making an hourly wage and trying to make it. Meanwhile, wanting to be a worship leader. But the Lord tucked me away and he hid me in that back sound booth. When you hear good worship, you usually thank the worship team, those sound guys. Who's back there? It's the Josh, the Kevin. Those sound guys translate what you hear. Thank them sometimes. They're servants. And I think in heaven is going to pay attention to the servants where you don't even know their name a lot more than we do. <laughs> Love you guys. But I sat in those back dark sound booths. No one knew who I was. I plugged in cables at 12 midnight. I remember sweeping this stage with Jordan DeMarco, if you know who that is. He's, he and Christine are some of our dear, dear friends. I think it was 11 p.m. And we were sweeping the back of the stage. He was in school over at Simpson. And I was a sound guy. And I'm like, what the heck are we doing here, bro? And he's like, I don't know. And we're just like sweeping and mopping the stage. Literally 11. It was not glorious. Honestly, it was not glorious. And I'm like literally mopping the stage. Just like, oh, what is happening? My life started blossoming in, in terms of like pastoring and preaching. And suddenly I was getting invitations to go speak different places. It was amazing. But... In worship, it wasn't going anywhere. And in my heart, I wanted to, to lead. The Lord was purging me of this, of this craving desire to be seen in front of people and hear the applause of man. He was purging it out of me. I wasn't very happy about it, but he was. 
But I remember telling about probably five or six years ago now, I remember telling my wife and my friends and people around me and my, my parents back home, I'm like, you know, I, I think I'm just gonna lay worship down. I think I'm just gonna be done. It's not, op- the doors aren't opening. We're not going anywhere. I'm not, I, I'm just, it's, the favor's not there. And I felt good about it. It was like, my heart was actually tender before the Lord, but I couldn't hear and see his face. I couldn't hear his words. And so I waited a couple of weeks. And I remember sitting with the Lord in one of our services. And I sat in the back. And I was like, God, I'm just gonna give it to you. I don't need this. I don't want it to get in the way. I don't want it to be a distraction. And he said, Peter, have you asked me how I feel about it? I went, well, not really. <laughs> he said, Peter, if you stop leading worship, I'm gonna be grieved. Flip. <laughs> it changed everything. I didn't need to lead for a crowd. I didn't need to be seen by people. My addiction to the applause of man melted when I really saw him. I would love to say everything changed in a moment, but it didn't. Years went by. And I chugged on my little guitar, plugged in chords in my back of the room, little back sound booth. Today, I don't know your story, and we're gonna jump into the word here in a second, but I feel like it was important for you to know a little bit of mine. When Jen and I had a conversation, we sped walk around her house. If you know Jen, she speed walk. <laughs> we, were, we were probably the middle of summer, speed walking around her house and we were chatting and she said, you know, what do you wanna do? And we were chatting back and forth and it's with all my heart, gosh, I don't even know if I want this job, it scares me. I think the moments when we realize that we don't actually want something, many times is the times the Lord gives it to us. I don't feel ready, I don't feel equipped, I don't feel prepared. I don't, I don't, I don't. And he says, I can work with that. Today, I don't stand before you. Tonight, I don't stand before you with someone who has it all together. You Oxford guys can probably correct me when I'm about to teach (laughs) later on. Hopefully not that much, maybe a little bit. I don't come to the eloquent words. My gifting actually isn't some American Idol award-winning gift. But I got one thing, and my heart's all his. It's all I have. I would dare you to believe the same thing, that it is enough. If you've been overlooked, you've been passed by, (laughs) he sees you because his eyes roam to and fro throughout the earth, searching not for the skill. I love skill, but for a heart that's completely his. Ooh. How many worshipers, like you would like, you would like say like, I'm a worshiper. I, I know everyone's a worshiper, but like you're like a musician or you're a musician or a dancer or a like painter or like a creative in some measure. Let me see your hands in this room. No way. It's like 70, 80%. Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit right now. Would your arrow of truth launch into these Levites and these Davidic priests? Would your arrow of truth launch into them? and where the enemy has come to pervert and to steal and kill. Right now, would you speak words of life into them? If you're a dancer in this room, can you raise your hands? Would you stand up? As a worship community pastor of this house, I commission you to move. I commission you to move. Where the church hasn't known what to do with you, where they're freaked out by you, where they're like, I don't know, how is it gonna bring glory to the Lord? I commission you right now to move for Him. That your body is literally a living sacrifice before the Lord. Where you've been pushed aside and given the side stage right now. Holy Spirit, would you come in and put a highlight, a a, a spotlight on their hearts right now. 
where the church has said your bodies are seductive or prideful right now. Woo no, no, no. Your bodies are living, breathing temples before the Lord. And when you move, He moves just like that. If you're a painter in this room, can you stand up? Yeah. He's the well and the water. He's the well and the water. It's a painting of a well over there. I don't know if you can see it online. They painted it tonight. I bless your eyes to see the face of God. I bless your hands to take color and pigment and cast it onto a canvas. Woo! Would you be artisans that breathe life into canvases and inspire people through their eyes? I literally believe that people are gonna look upon paintings and be healed because they're casting their eyes upon the Lord. And they're gonna see your, your lines and your shapes and your colors and your hues that look just like you and nobody else. And they're literally going to be healed. I bless your hands, I bless your eyes to minister before the Lord. Amen. Beautiful Jesus, we love you. Sorry, I'm sniffling. Beautiful Jesus, we love you. Would our life be a song to you? Would our life be a song to you? Oh, would our life be a song to you? Whatever you do, if you do it with worship in your heart, he doesn't care about so much about what you do, but it's the motive, what motivates you, what's in your heart, what's fueling you. Whatever you're doing, you're a royal priesthood. I remind you of who you are. If you forgot, remember. Recall who the Lord is. Okay, I'm gonna to attempt to teach for a little bit. You guys okay? Holy Ghost. Last week, Haley spoke on 2 Samuel chapter 6. You can go ahead and flip there if you want. I'm going to continue that a little bit today. 2 Samuel 6. Over the past year and a half, I have become obsessed with David's tabernacle. I can't move past it. And within about the past couple months, I've been talking to my friends and I'm realizing I'm not the only one. I believe the Lord is doing something in our midst. And I believe it comes back to worship. I understand I'm the worship community pastor and it's my thing. It's like, you know, the soccer coach is, soccer is life. I understand that. <laughs> but I really feel like worship is the expression of the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Everything comes up under that. Everything. Before we jump into the scripture, let me give you a little, a little background story. You guys okay? Holy Spirit, keep moving. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, I'm going to continue just a little bit what Haley did last week. If you, how many were you here last week? Let me see your hands. Okay, great. But, oh, not, okay, maybe 40, 50%. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, the Ark of the Covenant has been outside of Jerusalem. Pause for a second. The Ark of the Covenant was the intersection, the convergence of heaven and earth. 
It was the very presence of God. It was a box. And on top of it were the cherubim, gold cherubim that had wings that were pointed together like this. And they faced each other. And right in between those cherubim was the mercy seat of God. And that was the literal dwelling place of the Lord. If you go all through, I, I, I could literally have trainings on this for weeks and weeks. I'm gonna try to condense it. But if you go back to old Levitical and Exodus law, you, you can see in there all the different, like so many laws and rules to, to protect and uphold. Everything was under reverence. Everything was under the purity of the heart. Everything had a rule and a place and everything had an appointment. Everything, every detail. We serve a detailed God. He's not just interested in your abilities and what you can do for him. He's interested in every detail of your life. If I had sent, pause, if I had sent Jesus to earth, if I had been like on the board of heaven that sent Jesus to earth, I wouldn't have sent him as a baby. I would have sent him as a 30 year old who came in and prayed for people, healed, bam, bam, healed, blind eyes open ears, but he didn't. He came as a baby, Look, little Tiago over there, P pooped and peed and smelled. I'm about to go back into that world. <laughs> that tells me that the Trinity has a value for human life in every little detail, in every little moment. And if we relegate worship only to this room, then we miss the presence of God and the changing of diapers. We miss the glory of God. As you see a sunrise as you're driving to work to hit your nine to five, you miss the glory of God when you have a little cup of coffee and steam is rising off of it. And you see his nature in the steam like a spirit. He's not the steam, don't, don't get weird. But his nature, his likeness can be seen in everything all around us. And if you can see him in everything around you, you won't miss him. His nature sits everywhere around us all the time. And we reduce it to ministry moments in this room, bummer. He's everywhere all around us. And you are a worshiper. I don't care if you've been told you are tone deaf. I don't care. But if we can see the Lord and the dew on the drops of grass in the morning, I was out in my backyard this afternoon picking tomatoes with my little boy. And I said, God, what do you want to talk about today? He's like, I want to talk about this. I was like, what? He said, tomatoes. I said, tomatoes? He said, tomatoes. I'm like, why? Because they, they smell like me. Probably can get tweeted on this. The nature of God is found in everything all around you. And if you reduce him to this room, you've missed the manifold wisdom and perfection of beauty that is surrounding you all the time. Get caught up in worship, get caught up in him. When your kids are yelling at the, at the kitchen table and you're stressed out of your mind and you're just trying not to fry the thing you're cooking or burn the thing you're cooking, Everything's yelling around you and you pause for a moment and you turn your heart and your affection and say, bless the Lord, oh my soul, in the midst of the, ah, right? And you turn, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and forget all his benefits. And suddenly you remember the benefits of the Lord because he's so close, because he is Emmanuel, he is God with us and he is omnipresent and everything all around us. You can't separate him. You can't pull him apart. He's in everything. He came as a baby to show us that he loves your life and your life is worth living. I don't care where you're at, young or old, your life is worth living. And he has a plan and a purpose and a destiny for you. And he's in every little detail like he was in the, the details of Moses. Whew. You guys ready? Second Samuel chapter six. I'm gonna braze over this really quick. Second Samuel six, verse one, again, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Again, David gathered all the choice men of Israel, 30,000. Have you ever been in a stadium with, you know, over that 30, 40, 50,000? It's a lot of people. Verse two, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baala, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, whose name is called by the name, the Lord of hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. Can you imagine like, this is the people who like knew God. He sits in between those cherubim. That's how they knew God. 
He wasn't here. He wasn't around them. He, was, he sat in on that ark. That's how they knew him. Verse three. So they sat the ark of God on a new cart. Everyone say new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Benadad, which was on a hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, their two sons of Benadad, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. Verse five, then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir woods, on harps and string instruments, on tambourines, sistrums and cymbals. Verse six, and when they came to Nashon's threshing floor, pause really quick, threshing floor was a place where they would, they usually had like a big stone and it would roll around and it would crush the wheat or the grain that was inside of there. It was a place of work, a place of, of um, toil, a, a place of really producing something. It was a threshing floor where they, where they would thresh wheat and create, create grain. Um, verse six, and Uzzah put up his hand to the ark and took hold of it for the oxen stumbled. Pause. The oxen stumbled. The ark didn't stumble. The ark wasn't falling. The oxen stumbled. Uzzah was the son of Abinadad and the ark was sitting in his house. And I'd imagine Uzzah probably got really comfortable with the ark. Oh, well, there's the ark. You know, eating breakfast, you know, getting ready to go feed the sheep, whatever he did. There is the ark, there's the ark. And he became comfortable with it. God is personal. He is intimate and he is close, but he is holy. Verse seven, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and God struck him there for his error. And he died there by the ark of God. If you don't know the nature and the teachings of what happened, you could see this and assume God is cruel and distant and angry, upset, vindictive, you could assume a lot. Come on, be honest with me. How many people in this room read that and have a hard time with that verse? Come on, am I the only one? I see those little tiny hands. It's fine. But if you stop at the actions of God and don't press in to see the nature of God, you will miss him and you'll judge him quickly and you'll move on from him. And distance will grow in your heart and the distance will grow into dissatisfaction dissatisfaction will grow into bitterness. Bitterness starts producing all manner of things. I'm gonna make a connection here. Would you guys go to Numbers 20? Just hold, hold that real quick. I'm just gonna jump around here for a little bit. I love the Bible. I love the Bible. Numbers 20. Pause on Uzzah for a second. Numbers 20, verse six. You guys ready? So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and they fell on their faces. Pause. The people have been brought up out of Israel or out of Egypt. They've been in captivity. They've seen all these wild, wild signs and wonders. Pillar of fire, this Red Sea opening in front of them. Saw all the wild miracles that happened in Egypt and they get to this place and they begin just to get grumbly and uncomfortable and they don't like the food and they're, they're hungry. And when they literally are saying to, to Moses and Aaron, have you led us up out of Egypt? And we saw all these miraculous signs and you led us to right here. And now we're just going to die in the desert. How many of you have seen the acts of God and you get a little bit distant, make some assumptions and suddenly that assumption starts providing space between you and the Lord. And you start grumbling and groaning and complaining, forgetting that you have literally seen the miraculous of God in your life. You've seen the miracle of God. You've seen the hand of God. I can remember standing right there and the glory cloud appeared right in front of me. And it was this like shining, shimmering presence. And it was like always going up. And I would love to tell you that I had this wild moment of like weeping and wailing and had this like encounter with the Lord. But I just had this moment of absolute childlike, huh? I literally remember I, I ran my hand on the stage right there like that. And I had gold dust on my hands. Literally I was like, did someone put something in the vents? What is, what is happening right now? But it wasn't coming out of the vents. It always was going up. 
I left that meeting and I understood something about the children of Israel. You can see the miraculous of God. And if your heart isn't tender before the Lord, then the sign that makes you wonder if you're not connected to the Holy Spirit, suddenly you start wandering away. They had these wild signs for the Lord, but they were distant. They didn't trust, so they began to get dissatisfied. So in Numbers chapter six, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take your rod and your brother Aaron, it's verse seven, gather the congregation together, speak, everyone say speak, to the rock before their eyes and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod before the Lord as he was commanded. Now pause for a second. In Exodus 17, the Lord said a really similar thing. And he told Moses to strike the rock and he did and water flowed from it. But Moses and his frustration or we don't know exactly all that was happening in his world with the people grumbling, the Lord told him to speak to the rock. We're gonna pick up right here. And Moses and Aaron gathered together before the elders. Um, sorry, verse 10. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. And he said to them, hear now, you rebels. <laughs> you can see his mood there. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Verse 11. Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. Everyone say struck. Twice with his rod, with, with his rod and water came out abundantly and the congregation and their animals drank. You might not think much of that. But Moses heard the voice of the Lord that said, speak to the rock. That rock, I believe, is a prophetic picture of Jesus, the rock of salvation. And he struck it once, but he said, speak to it twice. And he spoke, and instead of speaking, he used yesterday's breakthrough to provide the breakthrough of today. I love this house. I love it. But if I don't take up the breakthrough that Bill and Chris and Dan and all the others I've paid for, and I don't take up their breakthrough and make it my own, then I will see what they did and I will repeat amazing services. And I'll become a professional at spinning ministry moments like this with the next new song, with the next new whatever that comes. And I become a professional Christian minister. Minister, We have a mandate on this house, whether you're a part of it or not. We have a mandate on our house to take the things that they have paid for and further them. We cannot repeat Bill's breakthrough. We have to have our own relationship with the Lord. If you go to other, how many people go to other churches in this room? Wow, a lot of you, probably 40% of you. Do not repeat Bethel. I love Bethel. I love it. But you must find the word of the Lord for your church. You must find the word of the Lord for your church on that country road in the backwoods of nowhere, whatever it is. I don't care where you're at. Big, small, doesn't matter to me. I don't care the size of your congregation. I care the size of your yes in your heart to worship and fully. I think there's gonna be a lot less people in heaven with these massive ministries. There's nothing wrong with them. Hello, I'm the worship pastor of here at Bethel Church. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But I think there's gonna be something that's different. When you were sat in that back sound booth in that little country road, in that little tiny church, and the Lord saw you. You can't take yesterday's breakthrough. You have to make it your own. Take our teachings from Bethel. I hope they're good. I think they are. Take our breakthroughs, but make them your own because you have to write your own story with the Lord. If you write somebody else's story, then you'll try to conjure up something and produce something. And you are worshipers that worship in spirit and in truth. And truth is authenticity. You have to worship like you. The oak glorifies the Lord the most by being an oak tree, not by being a rock and comparing itself to a rock. I wanna be strong and stable and like a rock in this foundation. No, 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 the oak tree glorifies the Lord the most by being an oak tree. Who are you? Are you a tree or are you a rock? You better figure it out because you will glorify the Lord the most by being you, not by being me. 
You can't be Brian or Jen or anybody else up here. You can't be Bill or Chris or anyone else. There is something the Lord has created is intrinsically inside of yourself. Your DNA, your fingerprints, your eye scans, everything declares the nature of God that will never be repeated on this earth ever again. And if you don't cry out, that little tiny rock will. And far be it from me for a rock to take my song. <laughs> no way. So we have Uzzah and we have Moses speaking. You could look at Uzzah and you probably, many of you have heard the story before and there's a lot of different reasons why you could unpack Uzzah. There's a lot of different reasons why he violated touching the ark. They had put it onto um, a, a cart with oxen on it. It was supposed to be carried in the back of priests. There's, there's probably seven or eight different things that you, you could say why Uzzah was struck dead. We can ask questions all day long and I don't think the Lord's scared of questions. I think he likes it. I think he likes. But at the end of the day, our questions must come back to the nature of God. And I think as the cart was traveling on oxen that represent work and sweat and toil of man, the ox stumbled, the ark didn't fall. But Uzzah, which his name means strength, decided to take human strength and add to and steady in his own human strength. Moses decided to take his own human strength and hit the rock instead of speaking to it. As a worship leader, I know how to sing songs that will move a room. I know how to open up people and I've done it in my own strength. And I've added to that cross as worshipers and creatives in this room, you are tasked with giving all glory and all honor to the Lord. And it is not by strength, it's not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot work your way into loving the Lord more. It is a gift of salvation. That cross, you can't add to it. This worship stage, you can only get so far and some gifting helps, <laughs> I will be honest. But gifting will pale, it will fall short when the anointing of the Lord walks in the room. And when he walks in the room, you better stop everything you're doing and stop your toiling. You better slow those oxen down and get it figured out and realize that your strength won't add anything to that cross. It won't add anything to the cross. You grow into needing Jesus. It's my honor to need him, one of my friends says, not your shame. It's my privilege to need Jesus. And I grow into needing him more and more and I want to grow in dependency to needing him more and more. It's my privilege to be needy before him. God, we need you or we've added to your cross, or we've added to your sacrifice, God, pierce our hearts, or we've manipulated people, or we've built mega churches and put logos up and erected massive buildings and done it with a hollow heart. God, we repent. And right now, God, we choose to build a church with you as the chief and cap cornerstone. where I've wanted to hang on that cross instead of you, when I've wanted to do it myself, my own strength, God, right now, I repent. Whew. I don't wanna add anything to your perfect sacrifice. The blood of Jesus was more than enough. The blood of Jesus was more than enough. The blood of Jesus was more than enough. And you can't do squat for him. You can't work it harder. You can't put it on an oxen cart of your life and try to stress it out, work it out and produce something to make him more proud of you and love you more. He loves you just how you are, just right now. You can't do anything for him, but in the midst of not being able to do anything for him, he wants you to. He doesn't need you, he wants you. And when somebody wants something, that's called love and lovers will run circles circles around workers. Lovers will 
beat out workers every single day because you're madly in love. You're love drunk. You guys okay? Two questions. What's the motive? What's the fruit? You can write that down if you want to. What's the motive? What's the fruit? I realize I'm standing before you today on Bethel's stage, which has global impact. I realize I'm standing before you on a stage that is very well known and very celebrated around the world. But what's the motive and what's the fruit? You can have the exact same fruit. You can make a stage just like this. You can set up your sanctuary and your band and your church and everything. You can try to reproduce something and it can be the exact same product, but the motive be different and the, root turn, the fruit turns out rotten. He is more concerned with your motive and what's motivating you than he is with what you do. If we try to reproduce and recreate what happens at Bethel or any other church in the world, you've lost the authenticity of worshiping in spirit and in truth. You must find your own way. You must find your own way. You must find your own way. You must write your own story. No one's ever done this business idea before, Peter. I, 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 there's nothing like this before. Great, you're right, sounds like a God story. I had this idea, no one's ever done it before. Great, sounds like God. This dream is way bigger than my capacity. I have no way I'm gonna be able to fulfill this dream. Great, sounds like a God dream. Whew. You grow into needing him more and more. There's nothing wrong with this stage. There's nothing wrong with stadiums. There's nothing wrong with impacting the world and millions of views on YouTube and all the different accolades. There's nothing wrong with them until your motive is craving the applause of man. And the applause of man will satisfy you until you go home. And the applause of man will grow silent when it stops. And your heart will be hollow. It'll be hollow. A stadium can cheer for you. And you go home. But if you haven't heard the applause of your proud father in heaven, it is hollow. These stages around the world, they pale in comparison, these worship moments that if they're hollow, hollow and void of Jesus, they mean nothing. They mean nothing. We are nothing without him. Everything we do is Jesus. We have one message and one message alone, the high priest Christ and him crucified. That is my whole entire message. That is my whole entire life story. That's my entire thing lived out is Christ in Christ crucified who was buried and rose from the dead in the darkest of nights, who descended into hell and rose again. You have one story. You have one thing. And it's the blood of Jesus that if you know him, flows in your veins. What's the motive? What's the fruit? I'm not gonna read the rest of 2 Samuel 6. I wanna go some somewhere, but I, I do want to read just a little bit about David's tabernacle and Moses' tabernacle. David, I'm not going to read it, but David, you probably know the story. David brought the, the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Moses' tabernacle was a tabernacle that was in Exodus and Numbers Leviticus, the Torah. And it was a tabernacle where the Ark of the Lord sat in the holies of holies behind a huge, thick veil. You guys know this. And everything was about somber sacrifice. If you were to go to the tabernacle of Moses without a animal sacrifice or some sort of sacrifice in your hand, literally there was a death penalty. You had to come with something. Moses's tent was filled with a little bit of music, but most of it was pretty somber. Most of it was really, really chill. Moses's tabernacle was a demonstration of the holiness of God. And it was beautiful, but it wasn't all that God had in mind. So David shows up, who is not a Levite. 
Levites were the only tribe in Israel that can minister in Moses' tabernacle. You guys with me? They're the only people that can minister in Moses' tabernacle. You had to be from that tribe, that clan. You couldn't minister. David was not a Levite. He had no qualifications. When Samuel the prophet showed up to his house, he asked Jesse to bring his boys out. Jesse didn't even consider consider David. He was out in the field still tending sheep. And Samuel went, where's the next one? Where's the, there has to be somebody else. And Jesse's like, well, there is the little runt of the litter. He's out in the backwoods playing his harp to the sheep. We've romanticized this idea, but steep sheep stink. I don't know if you've been around them. They're amazing little creatures, but they stink and they're smelly and there's nothing glorious about them at all. They're quite simple animals, really. But... Jesse goes and gets David from the field and brings him out. And Samuel says, that's my boy. Saul, who was king before David, was tall in stature, came from a really amazing family, great wealth, great notoriety, had skills in war, was everything that Israel wanted in a king. But he represents the religion of flesh. David came along with no qualifications a little tiny piece of leather and some stones in it to throw at lions and tigers. Probably bears, not tigers. <laughs> He's not impressive. He was the runt of the litter. He had no qualifications to become king. And Samuel uncorks his horn and dumps a thing of oil on his head and it pff, rushes down. But David didn't ascend the throne. It took years for him to ascend the throne. How many in this room has the Lord given you promises that you've doubted if it was him? I feel it actually in the room right now. There's promises that he's given you and you've had oil dumped on your head and you've been anointed and the promise of the Lord has gone forth. There's been prophetic words, there's been dreams, there's been verification of the Lord speaking in your life. And for some of you, it's been years and you're starting to wonder where the Lord is. I knew I was supposed to lead worship and I sat in that back sound booth wondering what the heck I was doing, hooking cords up. But I started to hear the sound of worship, not in a pad or a violin or a piano, but in the sound of the click of the cord. And I heard it as worship before the Lord. Some of you have been anointed and given a promise, but it has been time and you've begun to doubt. You've begun to wonder where he is and what he's doing. And I call back to remembrance those words. The Lord is on time. And you are on time. You're not behind schedule. You didn't miss the bus. You are right on time. He holds time in his hand. You're right on time. Sorry, I'm just feeling a little prophetic things in the room. The tabernacle of Moses was all about rules and laws. David comes along, the least of these, the runt of the litter, gets anointed king, then ascends to the throne. His first response in ascending the throne was to worship. He called all of Israel together to worship. He called all of them together. And he worshiped the Lord, the little runt of the litter. Worship the Lord. God doesn't need your lineage or your heritage or your bigness all your skills and all of your resumes, all of the logos of your businesses and your churches and your impressive lineage. He doesn't need them. He needs a heart. That's all his. And someone who's surrendered enough that he can work with that. So David was a worshiper. He needed faith to rule. So he brings the ark of the covenant into Jerusalem. He places it on the Mount, Mount Zion. We know that term. It's in the middle of Jerusalem. It would have been offensive to Israel what he was doing, like wildly offensive, like sacrilegious cultic probably you could even say. Wildly, what he was doing was, was unprecedented. We have no recollection in the Bible of David having an encounter or a specific word from the Lord to do this. He could have had it, I don't know, but we don't have that written in the Bible. So David not a Levite, runt of the litter, the sheep tender, doesn't take the ark of God 
back to Gibeon where Moses' tabernacle was. He takes it into Jerusalem. There was an entire village set up around Gibeon, which all focused around tending the tabernacle of Moses. And he offendedly, or he offensively took the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem because he said, I want it to be close. He recognized the nearness of God. He is offensive in every way. We talk about David as this amazing person, but when in the time, man, he would have ruffled some feathers, I guarantee you. How many feathers are you ruffling? Mount Zion was close to the people. And he took that ark and he plopped it down in the middle of Jerusalem. No veil, no outer court, no inner court. Unveiled faces, behold the glory of the Lord. And Moses, sorry, David, offensively went in and sat before the ark with no veil no high priest, to even see the ark, to even like be, get close to the ark. The high priest who was a Levite by nature, who had been raised his entire life and taught all the rules, all the regulations, once a year, once a year, he was the only guy in all of Israel that would enter into the Holy of Holies in Moses' tabernacle and he would see the ark of the covenant. And if he had any sin in his life, they'd attach a rope around his, uh, his ankle to pull old Joe out because if he had sin, because he'd fall dead. Oh, another one bit the dust, pull him out. That's how serious this was. And David, this offensive little shepherd boy, takes this ark and plops it down on Mount Zion in the middle of the capital city of Jerusalem and says, I want the ark, the presence of God, to be so close that people can see it. No veil, so offensive, and no one died. Why? David broke hundreds of rules probably. But God isn't, I believe, so much concerned about rules. He's more concerned about the heart and the motive of those rules. And David had a blanket of intimacy that allowed him to access a side of the Lord that the Lord had reserved. And he pulled it into the now. And he brought the presence of God close. He brought the nearness, the very convergence of heaven and earth into the middle of the people to bring them close. He called Jerusalem to come and worship. He put 24 families to minister before the ark. Sounds familiar. And their head elders to minister with the families, 24 of them. 24 singing prophets. They're prophets that sang. Chris Fountain, time to sing. <laughs> 24 singing prophets with 288 brothers and sons and scribes to record what the prophets sung. There were 4,000 musicians. We have like 80 some people on our team. And I'll tell you what, wrangling these guys is, is hard to even get a schedule put together, put them on this, on this stage. Jared, will you stand up right now? Jared Walsh, yeah. Guys, this is Jared Walsh. Give it up, give it up. This man administrates our entire worship department. I could not do what I do without him. Jared, you are a servant and you serve behind the scenes and you never ask for a thing, but you have the heart of David written all over you. I hear in every conversation I have with you, I hear in everything you do and you serve and you never ask for anything in return and you sound like Jesus and you schedule people on the stage and we couldn't do what we do without you. We could not do what we do without you. I honor you. I honor the sound of your life. I'm so personally grateful for you. You know that. I love you. 4,000 musicians. Can you imagine organizing 4,000 moody, broody, emotional musicians? Can you imagine? Oh, Holy Ghost, help us. He had 4,000 gatekeepers. I'd rather be a gatekeeper that sat outside the door than dwell in the tents of the wicked. 4,000 of these ushers that would sit at the gates and welcome people in. 4,000. He had 6,000 judges and officers to administrate. Who are my administrators in the room right now? 
Can you stand up if you have the gift of administration that's on your life? Can you stand up real quick? If you're an administrator in this room, come on, there's a couple more. I feel like there's a couple more. Who told you you're not a worshiper? Who told you? Because I don't think it was me and I don't think it was the Lord. You are a worshiper. And if you are organizing people and giving them a space to lead worship, you are tending the house of the Lord. Even if you're in a business, you're outside of the church, get rid of this like church and everything else. No, 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 no. Everything is church. You are the temple. You are the church, be the church. I commission you right now to serve the Lord with every Excel form, with every budget sheet, praise the Lord. I really feel this like resting on you that, that you've like almost relegated yourself not as worshipers, but you're a worshiper because the Lord looks at the heart. And if you're used to sitting in the back room, just by yourself, just doing the bills, doing the whatever it needs to be done, the Lord's eyes are upon you. I bless you and we need you. In the name of Jesus, you can sit down. David had 6,000 of those guys, judges and officers to administrate. And guess what? He paid every single one of them and housed every single one of those thousands for 33 years. By rough calculations, probably in the tens, potentially hundreds of billions of dollars. And he reckoned it worth it to waste it all, to adore and worship. Davidic worship in David's temple was loud and ruckus. You have lifted hands, you have shouting, you have jumping, you have praising, you have trumpets, you have cymbals, you have lyres with joy and excessive displays of volumes and undignified wild worship flies in the face of Moses' tabernacle, offensive. And you have flaggers going around and everywhere and big old trumpets, right? Probably not on the same key. I don't know how we got excellence with 4,000 musicians. I, I have a hard enough time to lead in a band of seven or eight. It's wild. It was excessive. If I had time, we would have gone in 2 Samuel 6 and Michael looked out from the window and judged David in her heart and, he, and David comes back. Like he was dancing and he comes back and he, Michael mocks him. He says, oh, was the king of Israel so dignified today? And David comes back and, and says, I'll become even more undignified than this. You watch me spin before the Lord. You watch me dance before the Lord. Some of you in this room have been told by people that you respect and love that your display of worship was too much, T-O-O. -O. Ooh. And you allow the voice of Michael to judge you and you allow it to shut you down and clamp your voice. Holy Spirit right now. If that's you in this room, can you stand? I feel that again. If you've allowed someone to shut your voice down and said you were too much, too much, whoa, 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 calm it down, tone it down, tone it down, back it down, back it down, lower the volume, dance only this much, praise only this much, your voice is too loud, T-O-O, -O. woo! Do you tell the creator of all the universe that the universe and the stars that are infinite above are too much? Do you tell the creator that the ocean is too deep? Do you tell the mountain you're too high, you're too much? Do you tell the ever expanding light that when God spoke and he said, let there be light and it's still expanding right now. Woo! And you allowed man to come in and say you're too much will you serve of God of too much he's excessive he's allowed and he's undignified and there's a place for excellence and I love it but sometimes we've allowed the voice of Michael to shape our lives and shut us down right now would you place your hands in your throat right now God I ask for liberation of voices in this room not just musical singing voices, but like the voice of your life. I feel like there's books to be written inside of you and you allowed people to come in and condemn you and say you're too much. 
Woo! Some of you even put away art forms and said, I'm not good at this because this person who I respect told me that it was too much and over the top. You serve a God that is over the top. He's excessive. And the man who he said was after my own heart, David, said, I will become even more undignified than this. I bless you to become undignified. I bless it. I bless you to become undignified before the Lord. I ask for the fire of God to land upon your bodies right now. If you're watching online in your room, the fire of God will land upon your computer screen or your phone screen right now. Spirit of God, would you break the box? The person whose worship you said, would you remember for the rest of time was Mary of Bethany and her anointing, her breaking of the bottle was too much. Oh, break it, break it. It's too much and it's glorious. Woo. Thanks, Jesus. You guys can sit down. Or you can stay standing, whatever you want. David sat before the ark of the Lord with wildness all around him, flying in the face of what Israel knew. And he passed it on to his son, Solomon. I wonder, this is Peter's wondering. I wonder if Solomon, his boy, if he had caught the intimacy in the heart of David, if he could have continued in Davidic tabernacle worship. But Solomon built the temple, which was beautiful and he put the ark back into the Holy of Holies, which was beautiful. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple, which was beautiful. But I wonder if Solomon would have been able to capture the heart of what David had done and pioneered and continue it. But the Lord is patient. He's not in a hurry and he's right on time. There's one thing I haven't hit of the difference between the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David. One major thing sets apart Moses' tabernacle from David's. One thing, sacrifice. In the Old Testament, you would have to bring some sort of sacrifice. There are all different shapes and sizes of animals or grain or some sort of sacrifice before the Lord. If you showed up to worship without a tangible sacrifice, literally, you could be put to death under just law. That was Moses' tabernacle. In David's tabernacle, he did sacrifice animals. But the daily sacrifice was very different. It was three things. Thanksgiving. Praise and joy. It was a sacrifice of praise. It was a sacrifice that in Psalm 95, he wrote, Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms for the Lord is great God and the great king above all gods. And in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. David didn't have any qualifications. He had no training as a Levite. He flew in the face offensively in all of Israel. But this little sheep boy had one thing, worship in his heart. He had intimacy in his heart and he allowed that to be the thing that covered it all. And he saw a heart of the Lord and he was able to pull something that was reserved for later into the now. Thanksgiving is costly, very costly. 
because thankfulness lifts your eyes off of what you think he's not doing and on to who he is and what he is doing. It takes the hands off the plow that are quen- that are clenched up, pushing the plow, working harder. See, I'm toiling, I'm doing this for you, God. Look at how faithful I am. And it takes the, the clenched fist of work and it says, thank you, God. American Sign Language says, thank you. And the open hand of thank you enables you to receive the rain. Praise cost you something. It has to cost you something. Like there's, there's a cost of praise because right now, every single one of you have some circumstance or something that's happening around you, some wall that's around you, some impossibility that's around you, some area where you could become so offended and so bitter before the Lord. And yet you came to this church tonight and you said, I'm gonna praise the Lord. And in your praise, you lift up your hands, you lift up your shouts, you lift up whatever you have and your praise costs you something. And finally, joy. Joy is not shallow. I think sometimes in the evangelical church, we've taken, oh, I need to be joyful. I need to be happy. I need to be put together. I need to be cleaned up before I come and present myself to the Lord. Have you read the Psalms? Those things are gnarly. They are brutal. David was not afraid of letting the Lord know how he felt. He was not afraid. Sometimes in the Christian evangelical church, we think we need to clean ourselves up before we get to church. Well, God's good, bless his name, all the things. And suddenly some people say these things and you don't believe them because they're hollow. Joy is eyes wide open and facing whatever obstacles in your way. It's looking at it square in the eye and saying, come here. Come here. I'm gonna look at you. I'm gonna grieve, I'm gonna mourn, I'm gonna feel it. I'm not gonna shove my fingers in and make just mindless decrees. I love decrees. But if the motive is of the heart is to avoid pain, then you actually won't enable or be allowed to walk out of the valley because you never entered the valley because you were too afraid. Yea, though I walk the valley, the shadow of death, Walk the valley because he will lead you out of it. And joy will be your song. And it will be eyes wide open. It'll be facing it full on. It'll be looking at the impossibility and your sacrifice will no longer be of goats and of lambs. It will no longer be of animals, but it will be of the heart to choose thanksgiving and joy and praise. What is your circumstance tonight? What do you need? What do you need? Do you need healing? Do you need financial breakthrough? Worship the Lord with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. Worship him. He's close. He's near. David gave us a picture of who we are today. The house, the temple, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've been crucified with Christ and you don't live anymore, but Christ lives in you. The life you live in this body, you live by faith in the son of God who loves you and gave himself for you. It's Galatians. What do you need tonight? You look full in the face of that impossibility. You look full in the face of that wall in front of you and you say, come here wall, I'm gonna sing to you. And I'm gonna choose joy and thanksgiving and praise when it makes no sense. You're gonna choose joy and thanksgiving and praise, not shoving down what you're feeling, but bringing it up and presenting your bodies as living sacrifices, living the life, the the mundane, the spectacular, the horrible, and bringing all of your rags before him and he exchanges them for riches. And suddenly your joy isn't hollow, it's deep and it's real because you've made an exchange with him. You've actually traded something in with him. It's not a hollow decree. No, it's just saying, this is horrible, this is hard, this is intense, I need the Lord to show up. This doesn't work without the Lord. And you bring it before the Lord. You come just as you are, not polished and clean, not all dialed up and make sure you're looking good for for a spirit-led church. No, 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 no. I'm done with playing church. 
I need the real people of God to look and say, this is who I am in all of my humanity and then trade it in for the divinity of God and say, Christ in me, the hope of glory is the reason why I praise. Full eyes looking into your situation and saying, yes, you come here and you listen to me praise. Sit by me, enemy, and you're gonna have your ears filled with the sound of thanksgiving and joy and praise. Tonight, whatever it is, I want you to respond to the Lord. However you, it, however you need to right now, move, stand, sit, whatever you need to do. If it's loud, be loud. If it's quiet, be quiet. But you bring your circumstance close to you. You bring your impossibility close to you. Come to the front if you want. Lay down if you want. I don't care what you do. Jump, move, spin. Be quiet before the Lord. But whatever you do, bring it to the Lord right now. You lock eyes with Him. Don't care about what anybody else in this room's doing. You lock eyes with Him. Choose joy and thanksgiving. Bring your situation close. Would you lift your voice in this place? If you're online, would you lift your voice in your room or your car, or whatever you're listening to? Would you lift your voice and bring a sacrifice of praise that costs you something, a sacrifice of joy that costs you something? Go ahead, lift it up, lift it up. Prophesy, Lauren. Prophesy, Desi. you thank him right now put tangible practical things of thanksgiving on your lips thank the Lord just out loud list them out list them out out loud go ahead thank the Lord out loud label them name them thanksgiving your heart softening. Thank him out loud. Keep going. Reach for something else. Reach for something else. I want you to put praise on your lips. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Let praise fill this temple. Let praise fill your own temple.
And finally, I'm gonna have you do something that's probably gonna cost you and might offend you. I want you to, in your own words, your own, your own mind, your own heart, bring up an impossible situation. I want you to hold it in your hand figuratively. Maybe, maybe real, maybe you need to get your wallet out or a metaphor of it. But I want you to hold the impossibility in your hands. Maybe it's a loved one that needs to be saved. Maybe it's an estranged child. Maybe it's a healing that needs to happen. I want you to hold it in your hand. And I want you to point at it right now. Point at it. Go ahead, point. And I want you to beckon it close. I know it sounds weird. I want you to beckon it close to your little finger like this. Come here. Come here. And I want you to repeat after me. You ready? You stand by me and listen to the sound of my praise. You sit right here next to me and listen to my joy. You come close and you're not gonna leave until I'm done being thankful. Go for it.
going to end with this. I know it seems a little choppy to end with this, but I really feel the Lord on it. I've been crying out in my own journey. If you know my journey with healing, I've been crying out to the Lord to begin healing people in worship. It's been the cry of my heart for years. And more and more I'm realizing that if we simply turn people's attention to it, that it's possible. It does start to happen everywhere. I was sitting with at my friend, Ben Wilson's, he did offering today, his birthday, a week or two ago. And I met my friend, Andrew, and he told me his testimony, his story. And I was just personally jaw dropped from a couple weeks ago when we were leading worship and Ben gave a word. I know it's a little late. If you can give me like three or four more minutes, I just want to open the veil on possibility and breakthrough happening when we give God glory. Andrew, tell me your story. All right, well, I'm gonna start on a mountain about a year ago. I was in Wyoming uh, with Brave Co and uh, had an amazing experience at the kind of the pinnacle of my life. I thought I had it made very successful in business and family, four kids, wife of uh, 16 years at the time. And so I came home from that trip, you know, on a high. And uh, it was a week later, I, we had some work done on our pool. And uh, I walked out um, just to turn the pool pump back on. They, they forgot to turn it on when they finished and it exploded in my face. Um, I don't remember a whole lot that day, except uh, at one point, kind of waking up before surgery, I had 14 fractures in my face, um, broken jaw, nose, uh, massive traumatic brain injury, and, and eight ruptured discs between my neck and my, and my lower back. And so I woke up getting ready to go into surgery, and I remember looking up at the doctor, and I was like, please don't let me die. And uh, so that was a week after this mountaintop experience. Um, go into, I wake up, my, I did actually die on the table. My heart stopped and I woke up on a ventilator a couple days later. Oh, geez. Um, and yeah, we don't have to keep up on that. You can take that off. Uh, so... So it then started the journey of healing, and um, you know, I I couldn't talk. Uh, I remember at one point I was part of the Brave Co men's group, and I was supposed to be on Zoom and looking at. It. I remember I joined a couple of times and was just crying. I couldn't talk, and they were, and it was so difficult. So um, to be up here, even just speaking like this, is a miracle. But um, so we, uh, I said, okay, he said it gave me two minutes, so. Three minutes, yeah. It's my whole life, but hey, I can get to this now in three minutes, no problem. Um, so, um, so we, so basically, I, uh, you know, couldn't talk, couldn't. And, and what happened was, I ended up in a bed, uh, sleeping in my office, and slept apart from my wife for over a year, um, or right out a year, uh, because I couldn't sleep at night on twelve different medications between the brain injury and all the pain medicines and everything else. And um, we flew here in March to uh, uh, just to be here, to come back. We lived here for six years and moved away. And then, um, and anyway, so we came back in March and we went to the healing rooms and still just pressing in, like believing God for healing. I've seen people get healed. I've seen crazy things, just probably like a lot of you here. But personally, I, I you know, I felt like God kind of, I don't know, he worked through my hands, but he didn't really work in me as much, I felt like sometimes. So I, I was believing for healing, but it just wasn't coming. And so, um, you know, I wasn't able to be a dad and, I, and that was a struggle. I couldn't do anything with my kids. I would literally sleep or lay down in, in bed for 16 hours a day. So uh, about two weeks ago, any of my, um, uh, anyway, so about two weeks ago, I, I come to church and I was actually at a friend, Ahab's, who a lot of you know, the chicken guy here in town. And uh, I was over at his house and we were cooking out and I, I was telling him, um, 
I just, I, something came over me. It was, church had already started. Ben had texted me and said, hey, if you want to come, I got a seat for you. And I was like, all right. Um, and I was with Ahab and I said, I have to go to church. I just felt this, I just knew I had to go. And I was, so I was like, Ahab, I have to leave. Can you handle my kids? Like get them back home and whatever. Uh, so he did, I came here and it was amazing. Krista Smith, Krista Smith was here, it was that night. If any of you guys were here, it was absolute fire. And um, so I, I've spent 25 years up front at the altar worshiping. Every time the altars were open, I'd be up here wor- worshiping and just, it's, I, I, that's the cry of my heart is to worship the Lord. And, and um, so I'm standing up here and I remember uh, Ben saying, you know, do something that you're uncomfortable doing. And all, this is what I was, I was like, okay, like, wow, that's a stretch, you know, okay, God. And then we went back into worship towards the end of service. And I just had this moment, I was, uh, you know, yeah, I I'd, ate I'd total of my neck, between my neck and my back, I had a ruptured discs and um, they were pressing on the nerves. So like three days before I was at church, I was laying down on the floor in my office and uh, it, the nerve pain was so bad, it would make me um, like have to vomit or sometimes even kind of be kind of uh, graphic here, but lose control of like my bowels and stuff. Like the, the nerve pain was so intense that it was just, um, yeah, it was, it was debilitating. It was, uh, you know, my, I wasn't a dad, Harley was a wife, couldn't make love to my wife, um, which I was told not to talk about sex, but I'm sorry. <laughs> this is... Uh, it's a big deal, right? That, I didn't tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the last time I got a mic, I was in Braveco and it was a bunch of men. And so I, it was a little different environment, but, um, but it's a big deal. You know, you can't have, you can't make love to your wife for, yeah. I mean, and you hear your friends bragging about it and it's just like, man, I'm just kidding. No, but no, seriously. <laughs> It's hard to be a guy and to have, you know, to be in that situation. So, um, but that wasn't enough to get me healed. Honestly, like the, the making love or being my, a dad to my kids, that actually wasn't enough. What happened was, is I was just crying out saying like, God, like, I want to worship. I want to jump up and down. I want to be who I am. Like you created me this way. I, I want to worship you. I want to worship you like you created me to worship you. And like I've done all my life. And, um, and God, I just, I can, I just remember standing there and, and, um, and, and there was no, it was at that point, there was no actual words being sung. It was just worship. It was just crying out, everybody just crying out for the Lord. And, and he said that, uh, he said, Hey, I'll heal you. Um, but you, you have to take it. You have to take a step of faith. You have to jump out the boat. And I saw this picture immediately of Peter stepping out of the boat, walking towards Jesus. And, um, and I knew, I said, I was like, God, like this better be you. Cause if it's not, I'm going to be freaking crippled tomorrow. And, I, but I, and, and he's like, he, he literally, I mean, I remember it clearly just saying like, nobody was around. There was nobody paying attention. Nobody touched me. Um, but it was the cry of my heart. It was to worship. And so I, uh, I just started jumping and jumping and jumping and dancing. And uh, my, I, I found out later, I got, I got home and my wife showed me a video. She was literally running around the house like a wild woman. My kids were, wor- wor- my kids were worshiping there and she had no idea what was happening in me. She just knew the presence and she was so happy that I was there. Um, and so now, you know, I, uh, you know, and I've been hesitant to even share this just because it's so personal to me. It's like something, uh, I didn't want to get up. I, I mean, I, it's not that I didn't want to get up here. I just was kind of like, all right, we're not going this direction tonight. Like, we're going to go home in a minute. It's good. But because it's personal, it's something that God did in me. It's not actually, it's, I don't feel like it's, you know, but, but testim- I know we're a house built around testimonies. And so one of the things I was feeling like, I, I know there's other people in the room who have seen healing, and, but you may not have experienced yourself and um, I just want you to know, like, God, God hears you. He, he is ready, willing, and able, and wants to just reach down and touch your life. And he will do it in, in the most unexpected, maybe not the best time. You know, he'll do it whenever, but 
he is there. And um, I just wanna encourage you, because I, I pressed in for a year um, and it just happened one random Sunday night when the Lord was like, hey, you need to uh, go to church tonight. So bless you guys. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah. You say, we say, we say. We guys stand. I know we're a little bit late. Holy Spirit, would you open your hands? Would you fall upon us? Will we be a house of worship, a house of ministers. First Peter says, you're a royal priesthood, every single one of you who are called by my name. You're a royal priesthood to minister to the Lord. Holy Spirit, would you break out in worship? Would you break out, not for the fame of man, not for the applause, not for anything that the worship can be twisted into, but God, would your name be glorified and would bodies be healed? Would mental disabilities be healed? Would families that are fractured be reunited? Would businesses that are failing be built up again? Would the Spirit of God move in this place as we exalt your name and we minister and bless you? Would you take care of every detail? God, we choose to be a house of worship, a house of thanksgiving, a house of praise, a house of joy. God, we choose to be a people of priests, not just Levites, but Davidic priests that minister to you and bless the name of the Lord with me and would say to others, come, come, bless the name of the Lord with me for he is great and his mercies are great. We love you, Jesus, with all of our heart. We choose to bless you in your beautiful name. Amen. Thank you. Well, <laughs> whew. there's only one thing to do, and that's to minister to Jesus. Why don't we just take just a moment just before I, I know it's late, but maybe just let's begin to lift our voices just a little bit, just to close off, just in unison. We're just going to flow with the Spirit just for one little moment before I properly close, but. Jesus, we love you, we love you, we love you. Jesus, we love you, we love you, we love you. Jesus, we love you we love you more than anything God you're the reason we came here from all across the world we love you God we love you God we love you amen amen we have a wonderful ministry team if, uh, our ministry ministry team wouldn't mind just making your way to the front and we specifically, uh, not Pacific Ocean, but specifically want to ask if you need healing in your body. We want to trust that God wants to heal you tonight. So our ministry team are going to be praying for people who would like healing in their body. Uh, I know it's late. If God's on you, you can just stay for a little bit longer if you need to. Otherwise, you're free to go. Let's just thank Pete one more time. Pete, thank you so much. It was beautiful. Hey, ministry team, just put your hand up if you are free and available. If you see a hand up that's free and available and you need healing in your body, why don't you make your way down to the front? They'd love to pray for you. <laughs>